Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the first event in the spring 2022 series of the City Talks on the theme of resurgence, decolonizing the city. My name is Cindy Ann Rose Redwood, and I'm an associate teaching professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Victoria. I'm also a member of the UVic Committee for Urban Studies, which organizes the City Talks lecture series each year. Now, as a UVic related virtual event, I'd like to begin tonight with our territory acknowledgement. We acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, along with the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and the Wasianich peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this very day. I'd also like to acknowledge tonight that this year, the City Talks, it's sponsored by the Faculty of Social Sciences and the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Victoria. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Jasmindra Jawanda. Uh, she's a new friend and a colleague of mine. Uh, Jasmindra is also a member of the UV Committee for Urban Studies, and she's actually the co-organizer of this spring City Talks series as well. Uh, Jasmindra is an urban planner. She is very much committed to creating space for people and places that leads to diverse, inclusive, socially just, sustainable and resilient communities. She's born on the unceded lands of the Wasianich peoples. And Jasmindra is a proud Canadian, but she's very much proud of her Indian heritage as well. And she, as a racialized woman, is both professionally and personally committed to centering diverse voices that address political, social, cultural, and environmental issues. Now, with over 20 years of professional experience, uh, Jasmindra has had a varied planning career, working in the areas of land use planning, community planning, and cultural slash anti-racist planning, among other areas. She has a master's degree in community and regional planning and a bachelor's degree in education from the University of British Columbia. And she also has degrees in economics and Japanese from the University of Victoria. Tonight, Jasminger will be presenting a talk titled Decolonizing the City with the White Elephant in the Room. So please join me in welcoming Jasminger. Thank you so much, Cindy and Ruben and the Urban Studies Committee. And um, most of all, thank you all of you. Um, it's an honor to have each and every one of you here today um, for our City Talks lecture series. And um, let me start off by saying Sasri Akal, which means hello in Punjabi, the language of my parents. And as my new friend Cindy has mentioned, both my parents came from India, my dad in 1950, to study geography and urban planning at the UBC in the 1950s. And my mom arrived on the shores of Virginia in 1962. Hence, I'm a very proud daughter of immigrant parents. And as a racialized woman born in a white dominant society, I am intimate, intimate with racism whether it was from my elementary school grounds, to my master's degree at UBC, to my professional career as an urban planner. Hence, I deeply understand the importance of equity and anti-racism. Topics that need to be mentioned into the planning practice. And this is how we bring racial justice, social justice, cultural justice, gender justice, and environmental justice where it needs to be. And there's ways that we can do this and we need to honor first and foremost, our indigenous peoples and what different ways of knowing, being and doing. And we also can honor our black and racial peoples and their ways of expertise, their ways of knowing, their ways of values. There's so much that we can bring into this planning world. And right now it's a Eurocentric planning domain that we walk in. So for myself, I say I'm a masala planner and masala as some of you know, means a mix, a mix of spices. I've had um, the honor of traversing the landscapes of land use planning, social planning, environmental planning, 
cultural planning. Um, and at the end of the day, what I realize it's not the built environment, in my opinion, that should be the planning priority, because who are we building for? So I really feel it should be the social environments and the cultural environments that we actually have to place as a priority and then build afterwards. And I also believe it is time to start building um, cities through racial, feminist and gender justice lenses to really build transformative cities. Before transformation, there always needs to be disruption and trouble and disruption can be good. And as the late civil rights leader and African-American Congressman John Lewis said, echoed loud and clear, let there be good trouble. And with good trouble, I look forward to sharing my points of view professionally and personally as a female urban planner of color with all of you today. And again, thank you. The title of the talk is Decolonizing the City with the White Elephant in the Room. And as Cindy has done a land acknowledgement, I'd like to do a land appreciation as well. Here I am, born on the unceded lands of the Wasanish peoples. Much gratitude as a settler and a visitor on these sacred lands. Decolonizing the city with the white elephant in the room. It is a great honor and pleasure to be part of this spring 2022 series of City Talks. And I am proud to say that for the first time in the history of City Talks, this is an IB Walk Indigenous Black and Women of Color series. And I say with great pride, I want to introduce my sisters as well of a color and Indigenous and Black who will be part of this series. Sarah Hunt will be speaking on February 17th, and she's an assistant professor at the School of Environmental Studies at UVic. Her title is Shoreline Knowledges, Practices for Unsettling the City. Following Sarah will be Jay Pitter on March 31st, an award-winning place urban planning lecturer and author, and Jay's talk entitled Healing the City. So in the next three months at City Talks, we're really excited to take you on journeys of decolonizing, unsettling, and healing the city. So let's talk about the uncomfortable. This talk is exactly that. It's about talking about what many do not want to talk about or name out loud, which is the elephant in the room, the unspeakable and the unmovable. Why is it that when we all know there's a controversial issue, the elephant in the room, that no one wants to approach it or nudge it away? Why is there a fear to speak the truth? What happens when we do speak the truth out loud and talk about the unspeakable? Well, it usually makes people uncomfortable, unsettled. And according to Ijimoa Olua, an author in the book, Let's Talk About Race, she says, the truth is we live in a society where the color of your skin still says a lot about your prognosis for success in life. This is the reality right now and ignoring race will not change that. We have a real problem of racial inequity and injustice in our society and we cannot wish it away. We have to tackle this problem with real action and we will not know what needs to be done if we are not willing to talk about it. So let's all get a little uncomfortable tonight. The white elephant we are talking about as many of you have guessed, white supremacy, as well as white privilege and white fragility, all representing different parts of the elephant in the room. And according to Dr. Henry Yu, a UBC history professor who wrote an article entitled The White Elephant in the Room, Anti-Asian Racism in Canada, to quote, white supremacy is Canada's elephant in the room. Many Canadians deny that there is racism or assert that there used to be racism, but it is now gone. Others will admit that there was this history of racism, but find it very uncomfortable to talk about the connection between white supremacy and racism. Without dealing with white supremacy, however, racism 
makes no sense. One of the magical outcomes of the political success of embedding white supremacy into our institutions over the first century of our history is our foundational beliefs about who belongs in Canada and who doesn't, about who is deserving of wealth and comfort and who isn't, and about who owns the land we live on, but who was already here. Who was already here, which brings us to land's rights and land justice. I'd like to quote Lee Maracle, an indigenous writer and author. In her words, where do you begin telling someone their world is not the only one? If we want to decolonize cities, then we must first understand that colonization of our landscapes built and natural has been in effect since settlers arrived on the shores of Turtle Island. And we know land reserves are an example of overt racial exclusionary zoning, where Indigenous peoples were forcibly removed from their lands to make room for development of communities and cities for the white settler European population. And it is interesting to note that South Africa during apartheid adopted the Canadian land reserve system and transplanted it, transplanted this racially segregated land use policy onto its African soil by creating separate black and color townships. The majority of lands that we are now all living upon are unceded lands of indigenous peoples. And yet there are only sparse whispers and murmurs about land rights, land justice and self-determination in the urban planning world. As an urban planner of color, I feel it is important to address that white supremacy and white privilege exists in the urban planning of cities, and to also raise awareness on the colonial and unconscious bias when it comes to how we develop and who develops the land. It is interesting that many municipalities are acknowledging the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 calls to action, as well as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but are paying little or no attention to land justice and land rights in the urban planning processes thereby ignoring the coexistence of indigenous peoples and their rights and responsibilities to these lands. According to Paul Daly, a writer for The Guardian, too often, however, the acknowledgement of original or possession and ongoing custodianship amounts to a little more than service when it translates to indigenous access to and use of the land. This is especially so in the well-established cities and regional centers where land, which has long ago been stolen from indigenous people, is now covered with the infrastructure, houses, roads, parks, civic buildings, which is a settler state. Acknowledgement of indigenous ownership and therefore implicitly of colonial occupation and dispossession is one thing. Granting indigenous people some determination of the land upon which our cities and suburbs have been imposed, quite another. It is self-determination in which indigenous peoples are continuing to advocate for as they understand the importance of sustaining a responsible stewardship of governance in their communities through their own land systems that are based on natural systems versus colonial systems. This further sparks what Daly says is a coexistence and co-occupying contradiction and ignites the political question of how Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous settlers co-occupy place. What would it look like for Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous settlers to co-occupy and coexist in place? Well, we do not really know, as this work is not really happening in our cities and municipalities. To bring the co-occupy issue into municipalities, it is critical in order to have planners and politicians incorporate lands justice and land rights into bylaws, plans, policies, and legal instruments. One way to recognize land rights is to include local Indigenous peoples in municipal land use planning processes and more importantly decisions, ranging from rezoning applications to development permit area applications to official community plans. This could be done by creating an Indigenous land use advisory committee, where local Indigenous community members are appointed onto a municipal advisory committee to discuss and share their knowledge and recommendations on proposed land use applications and decisions and the environmental, social, and cultural impacts of development on the natural environment and their communities. There's also a need for planners and politicians to start looking at the impacts of development projects 
by conducting social impact assessments, environmental impact assessments, and cultural impact assessments. These impact assessments are critical to ensure an equity lens is applied in all stages of project development. Land justice can also come in the form of renaming natural sites to their Indigenous names. Presently, the District of Saanich is redressing the naming of Mount Douglas to the Indigenous, indigenous name of Pakolds as part of the District of Saanich's commitment and accountability to the Songhees and Esquimalt nations and the Wasanich peoples known today as Sartlip, Pakachin, Sayout, Saikam, and Malahat nations. Which comes to the area of racism and land use development. Presently, land use development continues to be created through a Eurocentric gaze, which ultimately dictates how our buildings are built, how our public spaces are felt, how people can move around, and how our communities are designed and navigated. The reality is that aspects of urban planning and design are still considered colonial tools of land control, dominance, and segregation, which divides and rules indigenous and racialized peoples from co-occupying spaces with the white dominant society. Land use policies such as racial and exclusionary zoning were first enacted in the US in the 20th century in order to isolate and push away indigenous black and racialized peoples out of desirable residen residential locations to segregate them from the white exclusive neighborhoods. And regionally, locally, racial zoning has taken place right here in Oak Bay, Uplands, as well as over in Vancouver and British properties, as these were enclaves of white supremacy and existence, which legally did not allow racialized people to own property or business in these exclusive neighborhoods at one time. Racial zoning takes place also through gentrification and other forms of land removal, forcing many Indigenous Black people of color out of their homes and communities due to unaffordable rent prices and destruction of homes for large scale infrastructure projects. This is when IB pot communities become hostage to planning processes that impact their lives, but they have no say. Gentrification is happening everywhere. And as it spreads out, it is wiping out cultural enclaves, cultural businesses and cultural neighborhoods. In essence, wiping out cultures. But let's look at Hogan's Alley in Vancouver as an example of racism and gentrification. Hogan's Alley is a cultural preservation symbol of the past thriving black neighborhood that enlivened the Strathcona area in the early 1900s to the 1960s and was home to rock legend uh, Jimi Hendrix's grandmother, which is a cool fact, Nora Hendrix, who lived and worked in the area. In the late 1960s, part of the Hogan's Alley was demolished due to urban renewal with the building of phase one of the Georgia Viaduct in Vancouver's downtown area. Bringing it back to 2022, presently the Hogan's Alley Society has been working with the city of Vancouver to ensure that the redevelopment and revitalization of the Hogan's Alley block represents the important and vibrant legacy of the Strathcona's Black community. Part of resurgence is bringing the old back into the new. Hogan's Alley is a stellar planning process example of how a Black neighborhood is being revived from past gentrification to new revitalization with a Black organization leading the way. Which brings us now to racist land use covenants, which are still circulating today. These covenants are considered void legally, but the language still exists on paper today when you buy your property in certain neighborhoods. Presently and currently, West Vancouver Councillor Marcus Wong is sharing his stories of growing up in British properties and the racism that he encountered in this predominantly white community. Now as a city councillor, he's bringing into light how racist language still exists today through the form of land use covenants. When Councillor Wong himself bought a house in West Van, the covenant on his land title recently stated, no person of the African or Asiatic race or African or Asiatic descent, except servants of the occupier of the premises in residence shall reside or be allowed to remain on the premises. Yes, the province declared these types of covenants null and void in 1978, but these covenants still display blatant racist language and are an affront to many people from black and Asian descent who find it racist and triggering to see those words on their land use titles today. According to Councillor Wong, 
we have a lot of we have a lot of new Canadians, a lot of Canadians who have been here for many generations in West Vancouver. We talk about an inclusive, vibrant society and community, and I think this is an important piece to address. West Vancouver Council recently passed a motion in 2020 that requested staff to work with a lawyer on the steps required to remove the racist language from these covenants. Which brings us to racism in public spaces. Cities tend to be isolating, not welcoming, and not safe for many folks, especially those from the IB pot communities. Many people from Indigenous, Black, and racialized communities experience violent and subtle displays of racism and hate on a daily basis in city streets, parks, and public transit. A climate of fear in public spaces and cities, as it is in these spaces where Indigenous, Black, and racialized peoples realize their lives could be threatened and even lost based on their skin color, language, and appearance. In Vancouver, anti-Asian hate crimes went up over 700% in 2020, with the majority of these crimes committed out in the public on sidewalks and public transit. As well in 2020, we witnessed land defenders of the Wet'suwet'en movement being racially harassed for protecting indigenous land, environmental and cultural rights. And this still continues today, this struggle. Racism is, racism is real, racism is raw, and racism is ravaging. According to the Community Report on Racism in Greater Victoria, racism in Victoria is real with 71% of Indigenous, Black, Asian, or other persons of color reporting that they personally experienced racism in the last five years. Also, racism harms. 70% of racialized respondents reported that they feel undervalued, isolated, and unsafe in Victoria because of their race. So what can we do? Municipalities and police departments absolutely can play a more active and compassionate role in ensuring that public spaces are safer and more welcoming to Indigenous, Black, and racialized peoples and communities by building bridges of transparent dialogue and relationships with IB Plot communities. And this can be done through community justice dialogues and community restorative justice projects that can raise awareness of racism, racial profiling, and police bias, and the impacts on IB Plot communities. A Safer Spaces initiative which involves businesses signing up to be a safe space with a sign on their doors for people to shelter in racist attacks and hate crimes out in the public. Municipalities can also conduct a public spaces audit to locate which areas of the city that indigenous, black and racialized peoples deem unsafe and safe for them to navigate. And absolutely bystander intervention training should be mandatory across sectors and available to community members with an emphasis on public spaces and safety as many hate crimes are acted out in the public. The city of Vancouver, along with other governments, is part of Canada and province-wide 311 program, where you can dial 3111 with questions and concerns and report racist incidents and crimes. Many local governments and communities are now in 2022, developing community protocols for hate crimes. So community members are aware of how to access support and help when dealing with racism and violence. And this brings us to, if cities and public spaces are not safe for IBPOC, then the question arises, what type of planning approaches are needed to create safer spaces and places of belonging for those who feel invisible in the reflections of their cities? And two areas that this can be done is the area of creative placemaking and the area of diversity, anti-racism, racism, inclusion, and equity. For myself, I say, I'm born into a city I feel I don't belong to. It is important to decolonize for Indigenous, Black, and people of color to start feeling that they belong with culturally appropriate representation markers around them, validating their presence and existence in the cities they live in. 
What is missing from cities are inclusive, socially relevant and culturally significant public spaces where diverse community members see themselves, their values, their cultures and their visions being represented in the art, architecture and nature of the public spaces that surrounds them and where they can feel safe and a sense of belonging in these spaces. Sadly, I do not feel like I belong in my own city. Again, as I do not see any visual representation of my own South Asian culture in the built and natural environment public art or architecture here in the greater Victoria region. In other words, my culture is invisible, which means so am I. Creative placemaking. Creative placemaking is a planning approach, a relatively new approach, which promotes a sense of belonging by having Indigenous, Black and people of colour create the spaces of arts and culture in the city that authentically reflect the diverse identities, cultures, and ways of IBPOC communities. Creative placemaking is a process in which partners from public, private, nonprofit, and community sectors strategically shape the physical and social character of a neighborhood, town, city, or region around arts and cultural activities. Basically, creative placemaking is where arts meets culture meets diversity. And it's by reimagining urban public spaces with art from Ivy Pot communities. This is how we can start decolonizing the built social, cultural, and environmental environments around us. And I just want to take um, a section from an article that I recently wrote for Primary Colors. And Primary Colors is a, an amazing arts initiative um, right here. And in this article, I state, the champion of change that we critically need in order to decolonize whiteness in the urban design of cities is to embrace the arts as a key, key planning tool, allowing for the centering of art by IBPOC artists and communities and the stepping aside of European art in public spaces. It is the arts in its various cultural forms, for example, murals, sculptures, textiles, basket weaving, katak dance, graffiti, applied theater, and Afro-Cuban jazz music that can play a critical role in reimagining and reshaping public spaces by including the visions of IBPOC artists and communities. It's the reimagination of cities through the lenses of IBPOC communities that is critical in the discourse of decolonizing whiteness in urban public spaces. Art that is created by IBPOC artists allows for new, socially just, culturally appropriate, and vibrant ways of reclaiming and reshaping public spaces as pedagogical hotspots for learning about the her stories of a myriad of cultures, communities, and peoples. In other words, this is how we can decolonize our public spaces by illuminating IBPOC knowledge bases, lived realities, and cultural stories through the powerful platform of art. Creative placemaking also plays a critical role in decolonizing whiteness in public spaces by bringing IBPOC artists and communities together to create art that is rooted in community-based development, grassroots participation, and cultural democracy. When we create cultural democracy in a public space with art by IBPOC artists and communities, that ultimately ignites a powerful sense of identity and evokes feelings of acceptance and belonging that is inseparable from their cultures. And I just want to outline two pieces of creative placemaking uh, locally and regionally. And this piece that you're seeing in front of you was created by Kerry Newman. Um, he's an artist of the Quack, Quack, Quack Coast Salish and Settler Heritage. And he designed three large earth drums called box drums from natural wood to engage and educate people in truth and reconciliation by asking them to change their relationship with the land to one of more understanding, respect, and honoring. Coming upon these beautiful public art instruments in Cedar Hill Park, one is invited to play the drums with the hand to make music that echoes deep into the earth and reverberates into the hearts of those all around. The stories of the drums are essentially stories of the peoples, which are ultimately stories of the lands. In some ways, his art is whispering and echoing that culture is our healer. If only we listen. This is decolonizing whiteness in public spaces. Another example I'd like to highlight is this piece, which was created by visual artist of color, Sandy Joel, who calls it girls fierce like tigers. And Sandy actually is a cousin of mine as well. Um, and I'm very proud of her. 
Sandy, she's a female artist of Indian background born in Kelowna, BC, and Sandeep is passionate about painting community murals in public spaces, often depicting strong and fierce South Asian girls and women. And for myself personally, a few years ago, when I first turned the corner and saw her mural with an Indian woman standing on the tiger, I was instantly overcome with the rare and emotional feeling of belonging and cultural pride. As for the very first time in my life, I finally saw a representation of myself and my Indian culture portrayed in a public space. This is decolonizing whiteness in public spaces. So the more art we see from Ivy Pot communities in public spaces means that the process of decolonizing whiteness in the urban, design, the urban design of cities is working. Planners and politicians have the power to change the destinies of urban landscapes from colonial colonized places to decolonized spaces through the platform of creative placemaking and by bringing in new and diverse voices and faces in reshaping and reimagining public places and cities. Truly, it is from the inside in which the urban planning world will need to take a closer look at and be uncomfortable, courageous, and honest in asking itself how white supremacy and white privilege play a role in the planning and designing of public spaces and cities, and how this must change to make room for transformative planning with other ways of knowing, being, and doing. Sylvain Dupre, a non-Indigenous designer, substantiates, substantiates this by stating, to quote, Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing form a set of essential cultural teachings, which contribute to a co-design praxis and culturally appropriate context, and reaffirms Indigenous knowledge as a critical feature to inform spaces of inclusive engagement. I believe that it is by dismantling white colonial urban planning and design approaches and practices that do not reflect the present diversity of the population. And by building new planning paradigms of creative placemaking and cultural democracy that include the voices and faces from Ivy Park communities that will transform cities, public art and public spaces as for the people, by the people. So next time you find yourself gazing up, down and all around in a public space, stop with stillness and ask yourself, do I see myself here? I'm gonna switch it now into diversity, anti-racism, inclusion and equity. A very important topic that many folks, municipalities and organizations are embarking on. And I'm gonna take some wording um, from a project that I'm actually working on, just finished working on in New Westminster. It's an anti-racism project with the New Westminster Spokes Committee. So I have a few slides based on this recent report um, in terms of my work around diversity, anti-racism, inclusion and equity. We are living in a world and time where cities and communities locally and globally are facing a health emergency, a climate emergency and a racial emergency. It is the racial emergency that we must shine the torchlights of truths upon and recognize that a war on race has been going on in Canada since the early days of colonization and continues today. What makes today different though, is that the past has finally caught up to the present. In 2021, a national tragedy and shame rose up from the depths of the past as hundreds of unmarked graves of indigenous children's bones were discovered at residential school sites across the country. It took an initial 215 unmarked graves to prove that the roar on race has always been here. But the problem was it was never deemed a racial emergency. With the unraveling of dark colonial secrets and public displays of murder and violence towards indigenous black and racialized peoples, the atrocities of white supremacy and white privilege in Canada are now being uncovered and highlighted for the world to see that Canada is not the country it claims to be. For Canada cannot wear the facade of being a country of peace anymore, as it now must come to a national and honest reckoning by looking at itself in the mirror and understand that its past is still actually its present. And to finally wake up and realize that from colonialism to white supremacy, there is indeed a state of racial emergency in the cities across this country. This racial emergency can be seen in the recent rise of racism and hate crimes that are being committed covertly in the shadows and out overtly in the daylight across every Canadian city. We know that no city can escape racism as it roams in schools, businesses, public spaces, workplaces and governments 
in the forms of individual, institutional, structural, and systemic racism? How do we move forward in times when deep mistrust and fear lurks in communities of color and when systemic racism, white supremacy, and white privilege are the creators of this oppression in the first place? One of the first steps on the road to racial justice is to first acknowledge that a racial emergency exists in our cities and that the paths forward are ones of anti-racism and decolonization with indigenous black and racialized peoples leading the way with indigenous and other ways of knowing, being, and doing. Governments and organizations are definitely embarking upon diversity, anti-racism, inclusion, and equity work in order to address white supremacy, white privilege, systemic racism, institutionalized racism, and microaggressions in all areas of our lives. However, most municipalities and communities are conducting diversity, anti-racism, inclusion, and equity work in a horizontal approach, as this is often the quickest way to complete a framework or plan. But this is a, a hurried approach to areas that require sensitive and focused attention. So I see right now equity, diversity, inclusion work is done right here. It's all done simultaneously, and it's all done at once. It's a horizontal approach. And in my opinion, it should be a vertical approach and it should be a very layered approach. When I say layered, I believe we need to start off with diversity, not just racial diversity, but people with diverse abilities, people in the LGBTQ2S spirited plus community. We need to look at diversity in all ways. And then when we look at diversity in all ways, we can go into the next, which is anti-racism and anti-hate to recognize where these diverse groups recognize their needs and recognize their solutions to issues such as racism. So we have diversity and then we have anti-racism and anti-hate because it's only when we start addressing white supremacy, white privilege, anti-racism here, that's only when we actually move into inclusion, when people will start feeling that they belong in this layer. And when we start feeling that we belong and that we're included, then we're on that path towards a mountaintop where equity exists, which is justice for all. So it's really right now a horizontal approach. We're not doing it due justice to each of these areas, which in my professional opinion, needs to be done slower. And we need to take an approach that is vertical and that is layered. Because this vertical approach also involves a community-based approach to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. Because we're conducting this work at the community level, at the grassroots level, by conducting community needs assessment phases, a community engagement phase, and a community mobilization phase. It's really those three phases that are so important and critical in a community. And I would like to say that the city, the municipality of New Westminster, is embarking on a diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism framework. The reason I do a shout out for the city and New West and municipality of New Westminster is, it's one of the few municipalities across Canada that's actually incorporating the word anti-racism officially into its title of framework, because most frameworks and municipalities are called diversity, equity, and inclusion. But New West has taken the more advanced approach and have included anti-racism. So this framework for New West will provide a critical and necessary tool, sorry, tools and resources for the city to identify systemic racism barriers and to implement successful diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism measures into its municipal governance structures. Also in New West, there's a great example of how a municipality is decolonizing housing with its recently approved Glenbrook North housing development. And I think this is really cool. It's the city's first intercultural multifamily development where it's going to bring together First Nation community members and Swahili community members together to live together in one complex overseen by an Aboriginal, sorry, the Aboriginal Land Trust. A very innovative way to decolonize decolonizing housing. I also want to say that in 2020, the city of Port Coquitlam formed a new anti-racism, anti-discrimination group called the Roundtable on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And its aim is really a community driven process for feedback, action and discussion on systemic racism and discrimination. And membership of this group consists of IBPOC, new immigrants, LGBTQ spirited plus, people with disabilities, diverse gender and ages and people living in poverty. And according to Mayor Brad West of 
Court Coquitlam, he says, I think the sad reality, and we're coming to understand this, is that racism happens in every community. It happens far more often than we would like to admit. Those of us who are white, we do not see it or hear it, but it definitely does exist. And now for the city of Vancouver, and the reason I smile is the city of Vancouver is doing just amazing work in terms of leading the way in diversity, anti-racism, inclusion, and equity work exhibited through the city's one, its diverse staff positions, and it has two. One is called the anti-racism slash cultural redress social planner position. And they also have a black and, and African diaspora communities, anti-racism and cultural redress planner. They also have a specific advisory committee called the racial and ethnocultural equity advisory committee. And the city of Van is doing a very good job in recruiting, retaining and sustaining staff from indigenous black and people of color communities. And also the city has taken a deeper gaze into itself and it can be commended on its transparency and accountability and recognizing its systemic foundation in colonialism, white supremacy and racism. And on its website, the city of Van says, we wanted to take time to acknowledge the important conversations happening across the world and here in the unceded territories of the Muskegon, Squamish and Sable Tooth peoples about the impacts of individual structural and systemic racism. Racism and hate hurt us all and has disproportionate impacts on the black and African diaspora communities. Racism is part of our history and an ongoing issue. And we know that the city has played a part in perpetuating systemic racism and we must do better. And this is what we wanna see is transparency. But it's also important to encourage municipalities to join, this is where the public can help, to join UNESCO Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities. This coalition advances the call for racial justice in cities and UNESCO has created a plan of action with 10 points that municipalities and cities can commit to, to address and combat racism and discrimination. And in BC, there are only five local governments who are part of this UNESCO coalition, which are Burnaby, Lions Bay, North Okanagan, Vancouver, and shout out to Victoria. Within municipalities, it is so imperative to change human resource and hiring practices by actively recruiting and retaining Indigenous, Black and racialized peoples into leadership and decision-making positions. This is where race-based data can play a pivotal role in identifying how many staff members come from Ivy Park communities and paralleling this information with the demographics of the community. Anti-racism and unconscious bias training should be mandatory to staff in municipalities and organizations, as well as board members and community in order for people to start understanding the appropriate ways of working with colleagues and community members from IB pot communities. It is imperative that training is led by facilitators also with lived experiences from the IB pot communities. Another decolonial tool is to hire and retain consultants and firms who are led and comprised by staff from IB pot communities as they have the direct lived experiences of racism, hate and oppression. And this greatly adds and enriches any equity work. Consultants and facilitators who are white European, they do not experience systemic racism in a white dominant society. And in fact, sometimes may do more damage whitewashing the issues with white supremacy and white privilege. Which brings us to the question of, can we decolonize cities without decolonizing minds? And I'd like to take a quote again from Dr. Henry Yu. This is the greatest trick that a long history of white supremacy in Canada has played. It's magical racism of Canada that is the elephant in the room. This elephant in the room seems invisible. We don't see it, even when one of the legs is crushing you or someone you love. Another leg may be crushing someone who is Black, yet another leg is crushing someone who is Indigenous. But you can barely understand why you feel this weight on your back or that it is somehow just another leg of the same beast crushing the others. You've been blinded to the huge elephant in the room, the one that stands on top of us, but not others. The elephant has pulled some magical trick indeed, but we literally cannot see what is crushing us. So really it is about seeing and understanding white supremacy, white privilege, white fragility, and unconscious bias, and how these all play into race and racial injustices towards indigenous black and racialized peoples and communities. This is when great change can take place, not only within oneself, but outside in our communities. And in order to decolonize, one first must consciously embark 
on the journey of decolonizing one's mind. And there's a great uh, Kenyan playwright and author, Nugugi Waothi, Nugugi Wathiango, who wrote a book called Decolonizing the Mind. And it is that journey that we need to take before we actually engage in decolonizing work. And this journey begins by looking deep within one's unconscious bias and white privilege and being open to being called in, out, or even by an indigenous, black, and racialized person on your display of racism, microaggression, white fragility. It's interesting because Martin Luther King Jr., who we all know, during the civil rights movement, he expressed the sentiment over and over again. He said, the most dangerous and threatening white people in the United States were white liberals. What did he mean? What did Martin Luther King Jr. mean when he said the people that were standing alongside him marching for the civil rights were white liberals, but that they were the most dangerous and threatening? This is where it's so important to look into one's mind. And to quote Angela Davis, African-American um, author, writer, revolutionary and Black Panther, Angela Davis says, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And what we want is anti-racism in motion. In motion is when we find the elephant in the room and we push it out of the house of privilege leaving the doors wide open for indigenous, black, and other racialized peoples to enter the living room and start reimagining and redesigning cities. It is only by decentering the white elephant in the room that others who have been peripheralized can better contribute to the planning and creation of just and anti-racist cities with indigenous, black, and racialized peoples leading the way. So decentering is extremely challenging in the greater Victoria area, which is entrenched, a city entrenched in colonial power, white supremacy and white privilege. And for myself and the work that I do and others, we are constantly doing the exhaustion and the work of trying to create bridges of solidarity or allyship. We create these bridges in hope that you'll meet us in the middle. So some of the white folks will meet us in the middle and then you'll sit with us and you'll sit in your discomfort because it's important to be comfortable in your uncomfortability. And when you sit there, we hope that you listen actively because that is anti-racism emotion is active listening, that you sit with us and then you learn from us as we have learned from you through the colonial ways. But we are asking now if we are the builder of these bridges, if you meet us halfway in discomfort, that's when we can start decolonizing cities because that's when we start decolonizing our minds. Which brings me to the conclusion. I thank you all of you for holding space tonight. So I ask you, imagine what would happen what would happen if indigenous black and racialized urban planners, geographers, architects, and politicians were in the center, were in that living room, designing and creating communities and cities across? Can you imagine? Because I sure can. And it would be transformative. So thank you, shukriya. And again, um, very grateful that each and every one of you are here today and we're able to hold space for this uh, uncomfortable dialogue, but a dialogue that needs to be had. And I hope there was some a uh, bit of masala, a bit of spices of where we can all go forward in this important work um, towards building anti-racist and just uh, community. So wherever you are in your homes, um, much gratitude. And thank you so much. Thank you, Jasmindra. Um, such deep reflection in, in your talk. And um, let me take this opportunity to thank you tonight for sharing your knowledge, your experiences, and your expertise with us. Um, I'm very grateful that you, you are here today.
We do have um, some time for a bit of questions. Um, so folks, if you don't mind, um, if you look in the tab that says reactions at the bottom of your screen, there is the raise the hand button. So if you click on that, um, it moves you up on the screen and I can see you if you have your hands up uh, to ask a question. So please do that. And uh, my colleague and partner, uh, Ruben Rose Redwood, who's also the chair of the Committee for Urban Studies, he will be monitoring the chat. So you're welcome to pose questions in the chat as well. And we'll kind of go maybe back and forth with the chat um, and questions with hands raised as well. I see um, Rhonda uh, is, uh, has a hand up. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Go ahead, Rhonda. Hello, that was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I joined in. I double booked myself and left the other one to come and I'm so glad I did. Um, I did miss the first few minutes, but I didn't know if you're sharing your slides because I was trying to take notes and they were so abundant with knowledge and and I'd love to be able to do something with a research project with this, with the, with the course that I'm in right now with um, violence against indigenous lands and bodies. So it's, you're definitely talking about things we're touching on in, in that course and yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Rhonda, for making the time tonight. And um, I hold you up for the work that you're doing. And absolutely, um, I'll ask um, Ruben and uh, Cindy if they can kindly share the slides because this is going to be recorded. But, but um, yeah. Rhonda, thank you so much for, for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Yes, hi everyone. I did post in the chat the link to the City Talks website, and then um, once we edit the the video, uh, we will be posting it shortly. So, thanks. Open to questions. I don't see any hands up. Um, Ruben, is there any questions in the chat? Oh, wait, I see Lindsay. Uh, go ahead, Lindsay. Hi, Jasandra. That was great. Um, um, I have a question just about. Um, you were talking about bystander intervention and training. Um, what does that like look like to you? Like where, where do you think that could ideally fit into community and education and that kind of thing? Well, hi, Lindsay, nice to see you and um, appreciate you being here. Such a great question. So I, I see it everywhere. Um, most recently I've been doing a lot of work, um, happens to be a new Westminster, but um, on equity, diversity, inclusion and anti-racism. And I've interviewed people at Douglas College. Students have told me that the professors need bystander intervention training and that staff need at, school, at Douglas College, but that's across the university. So we, we need a need for it there. We also need, as an urban planner, public space. Lindsay, you know, we know what happened to George Floyd, but we know what's happened to so many brown and black racial bodies. So we need bystander intervention training for communities. So as a community and urban planner, I see that can be funneled through community agencies that can deliver these workshops, hopefully in kind, because not everyone can afford these workshops on a sliding scale. Because when community members see someone in a racist situation and they don't know what to do, that's when we want bystander intervention training to kick in. And then they know what to do and they know what to say. They know how to act. Because I've been in certain situations in my own life on the bus where I've been told to get off because of the color of my skin and, and no one um, was there to say anything. And then I wonder, ah, if someone had bystander intervention training, but this is the, where we need to go and we need local governments. Absolutely. Bystander intervention training. So then they understand local governments exist. They're creatures to serve the community. So if the community members are saying, hey, 70% of us here in the IPOC world in Victoria are facing racism. I think the CRD and municipality should be taking note of that and then looking into bystander intervention training to assist those community members. So it's everywhere that we need this, Lindsay. Um, and it looks like bystander intervention training will look different in New Zealand as it will look different here in Victoria. It will look different through an indigenous facilitator's lens as it will look different through a racialized person's lens. So critical though that we need it. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, there are a few questions in the chat. One regarding uh, the question of classism. If we've talked about racism and sexism and so on, um, uh, where does class uh, play a role in this? Um, also uh, in terms of solutions, um, you know, to what extent 
should these solutions be happening at the, at the city scale versus the federal or provincial scales? So the question of scale. Uh, and then also someone asked about um, if you could elaborate further on the vertical versus horizontal um, uh, approaches. I'm just writing these down. Um, I'm just gonna start off with the class system and I'm gonna be uh, transparent. Uh, I'm gonna shy away from that question because this really is about um, indigenous black and racialized peoples. And this is what I, I'm honoring the presentation. Uh, class absolutely exists. Definitely, there's different areas and that's another topic. Um, I'd be happy if that person um, sent a private message. We could have a chai. I call them chai and chats. We can go over further because there's an intersectionality in India with class, with race, with religion. But tonight's topic, I'm gonna honor that person um, is really looking at racism, anti-racism, but honoring indigenous black and racialized lives. Um, but for solutions, um, thank you for that question because we wanna acknowledge good trouble, good disruption, but we also wanna talk about good solutions. And um, I, you know, I saw that our wonderful Shamarki, Councillor Shamarki Dubois was part of this call and um, Councillor Dubois, or Dubai, and uh, I, yeah, he's here, I see him, because he was one of the, actually he was the catalyst at the city of Victoria to create the city's equity, diversity, and inclusion framework. And I believe there were five initiatives that Councillor Dubois had put forth. So what I can say, and yes, they did create an equity, diversity, inclusion office at the city of Victoria. So it's starting, and so a shout out there to the city of Victoria. Um, absolutely municipalities, they can start off by doing cultural plans, cultural um, assets and inventories. There's different ways we can address culture, different ways we can address equity. Um, provincially, federally, it needs to be everywhere. Fed federally, yes, they're looking at it. Um, that's why we have the coalition as well, um, and UNESCO. For myself, to answer that question, I really feel it's neighborhood planning that we don't talk about here. And neighborhood planning is, do you know your neighbor that just came from Zimbabwe up the street? And did you know that two blocks down, there's an elderly woman that can't get groceries? This is actually what we're missing is neighborhood planning to address racism, anti-racism, equity, diversity, inclusion. So we need more funding and resources through our municipalities, local communities. Um, because I am a strong advocate for the solutions should be community driven. Community members, wherever I've gone and traveled and lived, the community members always know their problems. They just may not have the resources and the funding. And that's where we can come in. We're not experts, we're only facilitators. So I would look towards having community dialogues in neighborhoods and ask them, about racism and anti-racism measures. And then I would take it forth into the municipalities as well. Um, great, great um, question. And then I would also look towards the youth. We need this in our education sector as well. Children and youth need to be, and they're ahead of the game, but um, great question. And also um, vertical horizontal. That's something I came up with on my own for myself to understand this complicated, complex work we call anti-racism, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Because for myself, I've been doing this work for 30 years, but in different contexts. And at this point, I do want to honor my mentor, Patsy George. When I was in my late 20s, I looked up to a woman, her name is Patsy George, um, and she is here today because I say I am the sum of all of the amazing parts of the women that I've met on my journey. And they happen to be mostly Indigenous, Black, and racialized women. And um, so Patsy, but I do want to mention the racial equity ladder, as well as when I talk about racial and horizontal. Because in the racial equity ladder, we have white men on top, white women, men of color. And on the bottom of the bottom of the bottom are women of color. So in white dominant society, we have a racial equity ladder to deal with. But in the work that we're doing, that be diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, why I say it should be layered and vertical, because right now it's horizontal. So we can't give due diligence to equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism if we actually don't even understand what each of them means. 
We're doing it too soon. We're doing it too fast. We got people's lives in our hands. So I'm saying, let's take a pause. Let's do it vertically. Let's look at diversity, racial, LGBTQ2 spirited plus community members, people from the diversity community. Let's look at diversity. Let's honor it. And then let's look at anti-racism and hate. And then when we start addressing that, let's get to inclusion, which is where we want to belong, all of us. We, we're not there yet. Will we ever get there? I don't think so, because there's uh, exclusivity, inclusivity, but we're trying to get to where we can get to. And then the top is equity. And that's justice for all. But if we do this work like this, I'm not sure if you can see me, but if you can, if we do it like this, my question is, are we doing a disservice to anti-racism, equity, inclusion, and diversity work? So it's, it's coming from a layered approach. And so thank you for that question. I've given it some thought because, um, yeah, we need to go in mindfully. Jasmine, I see uh, Finn, his hand is up. Uh, go ahead, Finn, I, I see you've been waiting a little while. Yeah, um, the first thing I would like to mention there, so there are two things. I like to be very pragmatic about these sorts of things. The first things that cities absolutely have a responsibility to do because it, at least in Victoria's case, makes up almost half of their budget is to replace the police services and gradually redirect their funding towards other social services and really address the need for police in the first place because they are one of the biggest insults to people of color in this city that we the city can easily address because it, they have such control over it through their funding um the second thing is the and i'm nervously watching those captions <laughs> um, the second thing is zoning and housing the housing crisis because this is something i'm speaking about this because it's something i'm very knowledgeable about and passionate about but I think to be critical for a moment, these diversity, equity, and anti-racism efforts are often very vague and we seem to struggle to find a specific direction and place in which to actually change policies and systems in order to have an outcome. And I think one thing that could be supported more is policies and directions that indirectly benefit these causes and the housing crisis because it ties into classism and indigenous people are disproportionately affected by the housing crisis and by homelessness which are very we can see that very clearly um, single family zoning is one of the main exclusionary systems that the cities which is obviously yeah, the topic of this conversation Single family zoning is one of the things that cities can address right away. And by making it easier to build housing and increasing the supply of housing, that is ultimately the most direct way to affect the housing, to solve the housing crisis. Because as long as we have no vacancy, speculation is going to cause things. And by increasing the vacancy, the speculation will sort of peter off. So. That's a very short, short-winded explanation of the housing crisis, but yeah, I, I'm also, it kind of sucks to hear the ideas around community inclusion in, in everything in land use because the people who have time to actually engage in this, the structure of their communities are often the older white residents and the people who own property as opposed to those who rent. And the people of color are almost never going to actually be represented in these community-led planning processes. And at least the current process where developments go to a public hearing is very biased towards the white homeowner crowd and the NIMBY crowd. And so- yeah. And Finn, I'm, do, Finn, I'm yeah. just- 
gently going to interrupt because I also want to honor some of the voices here, predominantly also the indigenous black and white. Be mindful of the time. And so I won't be getting to all of your points to honor everyone's voice voices here, but I, I really appreciate your detailed questions. It's just mm -hmm. unfortunate because of timing. Um, you know, when you talk about zoning and lots, you know, we, I can just speak briefly to this. I was a land use planner on the Gulf Islands. Um, absolutely is critical there as well for youth on the Gulf Islands and housing. You know, the good thing is we're legalizing secondary suites. We're starting to across the CRD, which is one tool, Finn, as you know, one tool. We need more tools um, and, you know, single lots. What can we do in a single lot? You know, we need to change zoning, right? The land use designation for these single lots so we can have more dwellings onto this one lot, which the city has been embarking upon. So the police, <laughs> controversial. I get what you're saying. Yes, we are reallocation of funds, mental health services, definitely with our indigenous with indigenous peoples, I should say, and health, we need to reallocate. What I have heard about in the States is community restorative justice projects, having community folks come in, leading those community justice restorative projects, with the police, but leading them. So there, there's some community minded solutions, Finn. Um, equity is such a large topic to get into. How does that get embedded? That's why we have these frameworks. That's why we have an office. But what I can say is equity is critical. So as a land use planner, if I didn't look deeply at archeological covenants, which maybe some planners don't because they're bombarded, it would have meant that I would have missed archeological middens, sacred sites. So equity is embedded in archeological covenants, which is a land use tool. There's many, many tools, Finn. That's just one example from my own lived experience that people don't think about. Covenants right now, archaeological covenants to respect middens, burial sites, et cetera. They're one tool right now if they don't have a development permit area. So thank you for your questions. I'm just going to honor if there's anyone else, some um, comments, reflections. I don't see any hands up. Um, is there anything in the chat, Ruben? Uh, yeah, there was a question which actually ties into our discussion regarding um, how do you shift power towards community-led uh, planning in a meaningful way? And I think that ties in with um, the comment that Finn made in terms of, you know, who actually engages, who from the community actually engages in these processes um, that a city might lead. And so, um, so could you maybe comment on how do you create um, a more inclusive participatory process of community engagement? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I, I can definitely comment on that because what's missing is effective community engagement. Why? It's because who is actually constructed, constructing that community engagement. And so if you have someone of white European representing and going into a community asking uh, people that are racialized, Black or Indigenous, the engagement is not going to be authentic because that person doesn't come from a lived experience. So what I'm advocating for is culturally appropriate community engagement. Anyone can engage, but how do we engage? Are we coming in with our implicit unconscious biases? Are we letting go? Are we unlayering and unpacking? Because every community for myself as an urban community planner is a new community walking in so I can actually listen and learn with gratitude and respect from other ways of knowing, being, and doing. So th there's ways, but culturally appropriate is one. Neighborhood associations, which are underutilized in the CRD, which are very active in Vancouver. Community and neighborhood organizations, neighbor, neighbors and community members wanna talk about what's happening with the neighbor down the street that's gonna be building and there's um, a proposal going up. So we also need to consider neighborhood associations. It, it's when we engage community, there's so many different ways, of course, the municipal way with engagement, but that needs to change. Of course, there's community ways. But I feel Paulo Ferreira, who is Brazil's critical thinker, he talks about pedagogy of the oppressed and the need for participatory action research 
and inquiry-based learning. This is what we're missing here. I think in the West, we do things too fast, too soon, perhaps. And we can do some pauses. Moreover, we have to learn from planning in Brazil, from planning in India, from planning in Tonga, because town planning is Eurocentric. It comes from Europe. But if our societies and populations are different, then community engagement should be differently. I think that's where I wanted to circle back to Ruben is, is having the right engagement. Um, I cannot speak about indigenous engagement because I'd rather have an indigenous speaker speak about that. But as a racialized woman, absolutely. We need to change how we do our engagement processes. And once we do, things will start shifting. There are a few other questions in the chat. Uh, people are welcome to raise their hand uh, as well and, and talk. Um, uh, one of the questions relates to the city of Nanaimo dedicating um, the use of public art to decolonize spaces. And um, the commenter notes that, uh, that these artworks are sometimes vandalized. And so how uh, the question then is, you know, whoops, I just lost it, but how can, um, how can planners create uh, kind of safe spaces that honor um, uh, through art, uh, while while kind of contending with some of the the reactionary responses. Thank you for that question. Um, last spring for city talks, we had Councillor Nadine Nakagawa visit us, who was talking about um, what happened there in New West with the dismantlement of, of their monument there, and we know what's happened in Victoria and across the states. You know, for myself, again. It's really having those constructive dialogues from those communities that are mostly impacted by those colonial structures. And to give that due diligence because colonial structures, there's trauma related to that for many people when they see a colonial structure. And that's why I wanted to say, many of us don't feel like we belong in this city, not just because we don't see a visual representation of ourselves in our culture, it's because we see racist markers that go back deep. So city of Nanaimo, yes, is embarking upon that. Thank you for sharing this. And city of uh, Victoria has, um, city of New Westminster, as I mentioned. You know, the town hall exists for community members to come into town hall and municipalities. And I've utilized it as a community member. You know, I, I think that's something we don't, um, speak enough about um, is that that's another process to get to, to politicians. Um, but uh, it's, it's a good question. It's a deep one about decolonizing in terms of our monuments. But again, if I can say anything, who's most impacted and those most impacted, what do they wanna see? And what we do need is new markers. And that's where we want to change is for white European art to step aside because we're bombarded by it and bringing in new ways of art, which will reflect others that have been invisible for a long time. But thank you. I think we have time for a few more questions, um, at least two more, Ruben. Um, they're in the chat though. Yeah, so there was a question uh, posted twice actually, uh, because I didn't get to it the first time, uh, which is, uh, what local Indigenous peoples um, have guided your, your own work? I know you said you can't speak on behalf of Indigenous people, but um, you know, maybe could you speak on how, how Indigenous knowledges and experiences have, have guided your, your own work or how you've incorporated it into your own work? No, I, I appreciate that question because I'm always learning as well as an ally um, with my Indigenous colleagues, sisters and brothers, it's, it's always a process. For myself, back it was in my master's when I started to study about India and in India we have indigenous peoples and they're called Adivasi. So I got curious about the tribal peoples of my, my ancestry, my bloodline. And then I had a chance to go to India and, um, and learn more. And then when I was doing my master's at UBC, actually I wanted to do forestry and I, uh, my thesis was supposed to be in Kenya with the indigenous women in Kenya. And Patsy George, who happens to be here, was the one that guided me towards the great Dr. Rangari Matai, who originally accepted my master's thesis 
to work in the environment community and Indigenous women in Africa. And I got a chance to talk to her through Patsy George. Unfortunately, she has passed away, but fortunately, she was the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize on the Green Belt Movement and the first environmentalist to win the Nobel Peace Prize in, as well. And um, my master's thesis originally was going to be with her. Long story short, the Canadian government deemed my master's thesis politically charged and they didn't give me the funding um, because Dr. Rangari Mutai was in jail. And then I switched my master's thesis to go to the Amazon, which brings me to Indigenous learnings there. In the Amazon, I was able to work with Indigenous youth and elders who brought me in um, into their homes. And these homes were, you couldn't get to them because actually when I went in, there was water at one point. I was in the Amazon. I was in Ecuador for about five months and um, in the Amazon twice. And I had the opportunity to sit with the elders in um, the Sakona and Siona tribe, I believe. And, um, and learn from them and as much as I could in a very short time. But it was the readings that I was told to read about um, in my 20s. And I've also worked in Haida Gwaii and I've been honored to work there in the school system. And I've learned from Haida people there as well. And today, you know, recently, I, if, if this person is on this Zoom call from the Kakite Nation in New Westminster, I've been working in New Westminster as well and, um, and working with um, some Indigenous people there. And, and they've been in my life. It's a great question. Um, I'm always learning. Um, I can say I have Indigenous friends, which I do, but it's, it's you know, we learn together. And, um, and Patsy George, who is here today, my mentor, is originally from India and she won the Order of Canada. And it was actually an Indigenous woman that had nominated her. And I see Patsy nodding, so I hope that wasn't, <laughs> I, she's nodding. So this is how I come from the black feminist tradition, which is we lift each other up as we climb. I come from the black feminist tradition because there wasn't any South Asian feminists at the time in the 1990s, but I come from the feminist, black feminist tradition. This is where we dish down lateral violence as women of color. It's all about lifting each other up. Because if women of color, if we're on the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, let's learn to lift each other up with light. And thank you for your question. I see there, there is one other comment um, in the chat regarding uh, the UNESCO Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities. Um, and so if you could maybe speak uh, to that, if you're familiar with that, um, and also how that, if there's overlapping between that um, coalition and the Human Rights uh, Cities program. Thank you for that question. I'm not as aware on the Human Rights City Initiative, but I'm, I'm gonna look it up. The UNESCO one, um, they changed the name. Now I'm just gonna say coalition because it's changed twice. It's a great, document. Uh, I've perused it. I've used it for my own work as a consultant in equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism. The sad part is um, only five communities across BC have joined. And so it's an municipal tool that we need to utilize. And it's a succinct document. It's a good read because they list off 10 points that municipalities and cities and community members can engage in. So it's, it's, it's viable, concrete actions. Um, and uh, if you put your name maybe to Ruben or to Cindy and I can always get in touch with you afterwards and we can always have a chat um, as well. I'd like to learn more about the human rights if you're involved in it. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine Duran. Thank you all for the great questions and comments. Um, I've been looking at some of them in the chat as well. And um, I believe we can also save the chat um, and uh, we, we can share that with Jasmine Duran. Um, at the end, end of the session. Um, I know it's getting late, so let me take this opportunity again to thank Jasmine Drew for, for a wonderful talk and just sharing her knowledge and expertise with us tonight. And um, before we leave today, I just also want to remind folks that we do have some additional upcoming uh, wonderful speakers and talks that Jasmine Drew also mentioned at the beginning um, of her opening. And uh, let me just take this opportunity to remind you February 17th, uh, Sarah Hunt will be our guest speaker as well, and she'll be speaking on shoreline knowledges, practices for unsettling the city. 
And we have one final talk on March 31st uh, by Jay Pitter again, and uh, he will be speaking on healing the city. So thank you, Jasmine, and thank you all for taking time to come um, and, and engage with Jasmine Jura uh, tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. So thank you and have a good night and be well and safe, everyone. Take good care. Good night.